What's up, everyone? Welcome into the All-22 NFL Podcast, the official podcast of the All-22 Fantasy Football Platform. It is the only fantasy football game with full 53-man rosters, including offensive linemen, where you get to choose personnel packages and have access to PFF grading and advanced stats to make decisions each week. To learn more and sign up, go to all-22.com, where you will now see that we have two subscription tiers, one that you can play this year for $1, which is our starter plan, and then one that you can play this year for $9.99, which is our all-pro plan. Go there, check out the differences, but essentially, this is the best time there has been to play All-22. Go get your friends, go start a league, and go sign up. Yeah, and go start as many leagues as you want, because with either of those packages, you can create or join as many leagues as you want, uh, either new team, uh, or if you want to take over an orphan team as well, try something different and be in multiple leagues, one startup, one you know, kind of a takeover, you could do that too. Um, there is no limit, regardless of which package you choose, so get in there and try it out. Awesome. All right. Well, you mentioned to me before the show that you had news to break to me. What's going on? Yeah, Christian McCaffrey is on the cover of Madden, of this Ooh. year's Madden edition. And um, for for you kids out there, maybe this sounds crazy, but for us for us older folk, I, I still believe in curses. I still believe in that curse. And like, I know you could point to like maybe a year or two where you're like, ah, I wasn't so bad, but like, no, it's still there. I still am a, a bit of a believer in the Madden curse. So if you have Christian McCaffrey in all 22 or in any other format, I, I wouldn't like that. That would make me uncomfortable. I don't like my players being on the cover of Matt. I just don't. You're soft. Um, that's I, cool. No, sure. I'm excited for him. He deserves it. I feel like, um, you know, he's had a pretty awesome career already. And there's probably not that many years left of his top production. Maybe we'll talk about that today, right? We're going to do the RB episode where we rank the top 32, Ray, running backs in the NFL um, honestly, when I went through this exercise, like I have the previous ones, this actually felt easier. It's funny. I don't know if it's because there's just such clear defined groups of guys at the running back position. I don't know if it's because the running back position is being devalued. Maybe I just don't care as much. Uh, I'm not really sure, but it does feel easier than the other positions we've done so far. Am I going to be the like the negative Nancy on this show now? Is that what this? I'm just going to be bad cop this whole episode. Because what comes to my mind when you say that it's so clear cut and easy to kind of define these tiers, I feel like it's because there are so many have nots at the position in this day and age. There, there just needs to be a, a, a bigger infusion of running back talent in the league. We didn't really get that this past draft class. Apparently, we're going to get that in the next draft class. There seems to be a lot of good prospects coming in 2025 for the rookie class at running back. Um, but Right now, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just the the uh, the pessimist of the show. But I think it's clearly defined because there are so few great options and so few like second tier good options that just give you the certainty to sleep at night comfortably. I wouldn't say they're have nots though, right? Because have nots to me says that they are guys that haven't proven that they are successful players. I think there's plenty of those, but the issue might be that they're all kind of old now. Like a lot of the top guys that have really proven their value are aging out, right? We just talked about Christian McCaffrey not having a lot of time left. You talk about Derrick Henry. You talk about Aaron Jones. Aaron I'm, Jones. I'm just the I Aaron mean, Jones guy. We, we lost. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't think Dalvin Cook has any more value. Zeke probably doesn't have any more value, right? Like so, the <laughs> Super Bowl Lenny, right? There's there was. A few drafts where we had a lot of really talented running backs come into the league, they're all aging out. So I understand what you're saying, where you really get nervous with the guys that typically you would say are in their prime at the running back position. So why don't we jump into it, right? So I did it last time. I talked about my tiers. I'm going to do tiers again, and within the tiers, we'll rank. Starting at tier one, this is how you will kind of... I'll, I'll tell you the top guys in tier one. You'll tell me if anybody else is missing from that group. And then we'll debate the rankings. But tier one to me could have really been a tier of two. And I think I made it a tier of three, maybe stretching it a little. I think tier one is Bijan, Gibbs, and Brees. Bijan Robinson from the Falcons is 22 years old. He will be playing this year at 22. I think he ends it at 23. But this is an extremely young guy leaving his rookie season, going into his sophomore season, new coach, 
better situation, better quarterback. I think I think that's as good as it really gets at the running back position. Although in all 22, you're looking at it right on your screen now, 69.1 season grade last year. Didn't really blow you away. While while the highlight tapes were amazing from a down to down basis, it wasn't spectacular. Gibbs, 22 years old as well, also coming off of a rookie season, didn't start the season as the definite starter, but I think just proved that along the way that he was the guy there in Detroit. Again, awesome situation. Excuse me, awesome situation, awesome coaching staff, and a 76 uh, season grade as a rookie. Uh, so that that might be intriguing. I think Brees Hall is the one that I really struggled with, including in there in that top three. He's 23 years old now, had a great graded season at 84.3, but he missed time in each of his first two years. So a big chunk of his rookie season, he missed with injury. Uh, he missed the first few weeks of his sophomore year and then also like was plagued with injuries just kind of throughout the year. Even though he played a lot of the games, he wasn't fully healthy. So I really struggled putting him in there just considering those things availability is everything at the running back position. Uh, so I really struggled there, but what do you think of the top three? Is there anybody else missing? Should those three be the three that are considered here? Yes. And again, I'll always say it at the start of these episodes, all 22 is a dynasty format. It's as if you were starting a franchise today and building your, your team and your roster. It's not, a season long one year fantasy or, Oh, well, yeah. Christian McCaffrey of course is, is the top pick and you know, it, it, it doesn't work that way. Right. Um, we are, we're, we're in this looking at sort of the, the three year window, the five year window, what have you um, kind of going for the, for the long haul. Right. And so with that, that's where the age kind of comes into play where yes, today and likely this season, Christian McCaffrey is fantastic. Um, probably the odds on favorite to be the highest score in the game. There are, uh, or scoring running back in the game. There are a couple others that are in contention that maybe we'll get into like a Derrick Henry or what have you. But I think those three names are the top three. And regarding the Brees Hall concern, I think what gives me the two things that give me optimism to leave him there, even if I, I think he's probably third in that tier is that the situation hasn't been good either in, in New York once, you know, once Rogers went down and everything just kind of just, just went to hell there. Uh, he's produced when on the field, he's been efficient. And even if someone like a Braylon Allen carves out a role for himself, maybe steals a couple goal line carries or something, you know, it's a little early, but we're just sort of projecting here since this is all 22 and we're just worried about how he performs overall. We're not concerned with, you know, getting vultured for a one or two yard carry in the end zone, right? If Brees Hall is a good player and is performing well on the field, that stuff doesn't matter, right? Because we're just spotting talent and drafting good players. And I think given the return of Rodgers, uh, the the improvements that they've made on the offensive line uh, in general, so even when you don't account for the return of Rodgers, I think that line as a whole has improved with some of the moves they've made that's enough for at least to say, okay, you have, uh, you have Brees Hall here. I think he already has performed well. So as long as he is healthy, he's going to perform well. And if they cut back his workload a little bit to try to manage his health and bring in another spell back in there to take on a bit more of a role in that offense, that's perfectly fine. He's going to hit his snaps each week. He's going to do what he needs to do, and he will still grade well for you. So I think with that in mind, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with leaving Brees Hall in the top tier, I would think he's third in that tier, but I would not drop him to tier two. I think he belongs. He's closer to Robinson and Gibbs than he is anybody else. Okay. All right. So let's make him three, but that really leaves those top two for us to debate. I think that there is a case for Gibbs to be number one. I really do. Um, phenomenal rookie season, fantastic situation. Uh, and he reminds me a lot. My comp for him in the draft last year was Alvin Kamara and there's so much about his game that resembles that, but there's also this semblance of just because he wasn't the top back picked in the draft, people just devalue him. But what has Alvin Kamara done except for been really the best running back, you know, year in and year out amongst the peers that he played against, right? In, in drafts that's surrounded by like guys like Zeke and Saquon, he really has been super consistent uh, throughout his career. So I think that there's a case to say Gibbs is actually – He's proved to us already that he should be in the conversation for number one overall, but I think I still need one more year 
before I'm willing to do that, right? Like I need I need to see Bijan struggle for another year to move him from that top spot because I saw such elite talent, right? Like while we're while we're saying Gibbs is Kamara, Bijan might be Ladinian Tomlinson, right? Like he might be like this, not just great for his draft class, but great for his era. And for me, that that holds a lot of weight, and it's gonna take more than one bad coaching staff year to to really take him out of that. For me, I still think Bijan is the number one. If he does it again with the new coaching staff and Kirk there, absolutely, I'm moving him down and moving Gibbs up. But I think for this year, at least, my, my money's still on Bijan. I, th- I think for very different reasons. They both were prevented from having those like breakout, take over the game type of weeks from their coaches and offense in general last year. For Bijan, it was just because it was a horrendously run offense and Arthur Smith is finally out of there. Um, with Gibbs, it's because they kind of brought him along slowly. They had Montgomery in there uh, to take some carries as well and kind of lean on him as a veteran uh, to get those tough yards. And then Gibbs would come in, have some big runs. Wasn't necessarily in the role to where he could find a rhythm and be that consistent down to down back more so hit some home runs, make some plays, but as a rookie still struggled in some areas, uh, pass blocking was not very good, but I think we saw him really, really improve in the playoffs. And obviously we don't have his NFL playoff grading here because that's not part of your, uh, fantasy football season. Um, but he really came on in the playoffs as well to where I think Bijan clearly had the better regular season between the two of them, but Gibbs kind of pulled right even there with him because of his playoff performance. Now Bijan gets a, a, a an improved situation on offense gets ideally anyway, or theoretically with, uh, with uh, better coaching, with uh, a better quarterback there to kind of open things up. I still give him the edge as well, but I'm not, I'm not upset at all. If I, if, if someone snipes me, you know, with one of these guys and I just get whoever's left over, I'm perfectly fine with, with either of them. I think they're both in good situations moving forward and they're great players that for the next three to four years, at least. And at running back, that's a long time. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And it almost is a 1A, 1B, I think. But for now, you know, just for the sake of this exercise, Bijan will be the number one. Gibbs will be two. Brees Hall will be three. And then we get into my tier two. To the argument you made before, right? Like the group isn't great. Once you get out of that top three, there is this massive drop off because while you do trust a Christian McCaffrey, He's 28 years old, right? And in running back terms, that's like people arguing Joe Biden is too old to be president, right? It's like, you're just... <laughs> that's, that's where we're going this episode, okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking around. But I'm just saying like 28 years old is is about as old as you can be to still be an effective running back in the NFL and honestly might be too old, right? Like there's only one Derrick Henry that is still playing well at that age and it's Derrick Henry, right? There's nobody else that passed that 28 threshold and has still been very good. I think McCaffrey has a very good case to be, especially in that San Francisco offense, but it doesn't give you a ton of confidence. He is in my tier two. Uh, I think I'll just run through it, and then maybe we'll talk about it then. So Christian McCaffrey, Jonathan Taylor, Kyron Williams, Travis Etienne, Devin A. Chain, Ken Walker, Jonathan Brooks, Isaiah Pacheco, and Trey Benson. Again, I don't feel great about most of that, but I do think that the reason I'm comfortable including some of these guys is because, yes, you know, the high ends of McCaffrey's, the Taylors are extremely good, right? So you're going to bet on guys like that. Then the Kyrens, the Etienne's, those guys, Walker, Pacheco, they're young enough and good enough and consistent enough that you feel good about them, right? So, you, so you're comfortable drafting them early. And then the Brooks and the Benson, those are guys that are, 20 and 21 years old that are entering their rookie seasons with promising situations and will have every opportunity to be starters there. You kind of buy into that just because the age factor is so important for running backs, right? So that's kind of my tier two. I think there's plenty of arguments that can be made for other guys to be included in this. I'm sure you're screaming in your head about Saquon not being in that list, right? Um, But to me, they're, these are the guys that are still young enough and good enough 
for me to consider taking at that next tier. And again, this is all 22. This isn't regular fantasy. I don't really give a crap if you get a ton of yards and touchdowns. While some of that translates here, it's also important that you're just a good all, all around running back, meaning you block on blocking, you know, when you're asked to block, you catch the ball as a receiver, you, you, uh, you know, do all of the things necessary to be a good running back in the NFL, not just I'm going to get the ball 30 times and I'm going to run and I'm going to average 3.7 yards a carry because that's not necessarily effective in this platform. Right. And, and there is, so there is a correlation, right. For the most yeah. part, I mean, it's not like you have, uh, I don't know, um, some, some random dude, uh, Deuce Vaughn or something is high up on here because, you know, we're just so different. Like if, if you get a lot of yards and touchdowns, you're probably doing something right. And you're grading very well. Um, so let's get that out of the way. But here's the thing. If you're going to include someone like Christian McCaffrey in this tier, which you should, I, you, you can't not have him in one of your top two tiers. When you look ahead, and this is, this is sort of how you attack it, um, if you're looking at this from a long-term perspective, many people will look at the upcoming draft class and say, hey, running back looks deep. Run, like running back for 2025 is what wide receiver was for 2024 as in terms of the NFL draft. So I can go ahead and take a Christian McCaffrey over a, a Travis Etienne uh, or, or someone to that effect, get that really high end production in 2024. And then I'll just replace him next year with a younger running back who could hit the ground running in 2025 because there's lots of talented ones. And again, since this is all 22, they're not going first overall in your rookie drafts like they are in a standard format, right? Because the top quarterbacks, the top tackles, edge rushers, whoever, the actual best players are going first in your all 22 rookie drafts, not just the guys who record stats and, you know, get yards and touchdowns at running back. So that's a strategy that you can employ. And with that, that would move someone like McCaffrey up on my list of tier two players. And if I'm doing that, I'll go ahead and project that, hey, Saquon Barkley finally has uh, a, a, a decent, and by decent, I mean good offensive line, finally a good situation on offense instead of a historically inept, impotent, whatever negative connotation you want to put on the New York Giants offense is probably not strong enough for how pathetic they've been his entire career there. So now that he's got a semblance of that and we know how talented he is, he was still a top six overall breakaway running back uh, in 2023. So his breakaway percentage was top six in a horrid offense. By all means, you can put him in there as a 27-year-old, say, you know, one or two years tops, and then you go ahead and employ the same strategy that you would with a Christian McCaffrey. I understand maybe taking a Kyron Williams first because you say he's still just 23 years old and you're going to get more mileage out of that and he's still a very productive back but i think and maybe a, a kenneth walker as well because again the the whole spell back or the the rotation between walker and charbonnet in seattle doesn't bug me as much because again i'm not worried about volume i'm worried about actual performance and how good this player is and the so, production is still pretty yeah. one-sided to walker it, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just, you know, oh, you don't have to worry about getting sniped at the goal line or something and it ruining your week. That that doesn't matter right. um, in, in this instance, which which I know you pointed out. So maybe a Kyron Williams or a Kenneth Walker at the top of this tier. But then after that, I'm saying I'm not dropping someone like Christian McCaffrey anymore and certainly not behind uh, a name like Jonathan Brooks, who's coming off of an injury uh, as well. Yes, he's very young, but again, he, he tore his knee in November. So he's not going to hit the ground running most likely in 2024. So if you have to wait, then 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 what what are we doing here? When you could just get a, a, a another young back next seat, you know, in, in the next draft class who doesn't have that injury concern, and and you didn't just pocket a year waiting for this guy to get healthy. So I think that's where I would lean. I would lean towards Kyron Williams, Kenneth Walker, and then I'm looking at. Uh, then I'm looking at Christian McCaffrey. I am putting Saquon in there. Um, Tony Pollard, I have to see it in his new digs. Trey Benson, maybe. And then I don't think you mentioned Derrick Henry, but I know he's going to be 30, but until we see him slow down, like his situation got better. Any slowdown, is that mitigated by the fact that he's now in Baltimore with a very run-friendly 
um, quarterback next to him that just opens up wide open lanes and that offense as a whole, as far as weapons go, has gotten deeper. I don't know. I mean, by the time, once you're 28, like what difference does it make if you're 28 or 29? I'm just projecting you to have one good season left in your career anyway. So why not take the best one? Henry has an argument for that. That was a lot to unpack, Ray. Um, it is. It is. Henry I, Henry has a lot of upside with the Ravens, but 30 is different. There's one running back that made even my conversation for today that's over 30, and I don't feel I even know there was another running back out there. Who's a running back out there that's mm, – yes. Most okay. 32, right? Yeah. Very different t- style of running back. Also has probably like an eighth of the career carries that Derrick Henry has. Yeah. So – I don't think I could include Derrick Henry in tier two for those reasons. Like if he has a good season this year, it's an absolute miracle, but the games that he plays are going to be fantastic. So I will put him in this conversation. Um, But you mentioned Saquon needs to be included in this. I really struggle with Saquon just because what we have seen, although the situation was poor, has never really met our expectations from great, from a grading standpoint, if you want to pull up his, his card, right? So it hasn't met our expectations from a grading standpoint. He's also now already 27. So when you talked about once you get to 28, you only really have a year left. So are we saying that Saquon probably only has two years left? If so, again, we're only talking about one year in his career where he hit 80, and that was his rookie year. So we're now six years removed from that. Hasn't touched 80 since. Do I think he could touch 80 this year? Absolutely. And I think it's probably pretty likely. But to have only one or two years of that production – that's still a question mark, right? Because he hasn't done it in so long. That scares me. Also, the injury stuff, he has faced injuries in his career. So is he going to age as well as other guys? I mean, McCaffrey has had injuries as well, right? He's just a few a few more years removed from them, so we forget. But I do struggle with Saquon. I think the other guy you didn't mention that I kind of expected you to was Josh Jacobs, right? He's a year younger than Saquon, 26 years old, goes to a also significantly better situation in Green Bay, uh, Aaron, replaces Aaron Jones. But this is a guy that, from a grading standpoint, has been extremely productive in all 22, has two seasons, as you can see, with that blue grading, 91.62 years ago. His rookie year was in 87. And then high 70s the other years. Last year was really the only other year that wasn't up to that standard. He graded 65 last year. You talk about that situation in Vegas last year, they didn't have a quarterback, right? Like everything was on this dude's shoulders. He now goes to Green Bay. I they they also drafted guys so that I don't think he'll have to be just a bell cow himself. I like everything that Green Bay has done for Jacobs and what that situation means for him. I think Jacobs for me is above a Saquon going forward. Uh, but I still have him in my tier three because he is 26 years old, right? And when you're talking about these guys. Am I really taking him and Saquon over Benson and Brooks when there's a six, seven year age gap between them, right? And you're getting essentially an entire career of a promising prospect compared to just maybe two or three really high end years. I struggle with that, but just for argument's sake, right? So that we can start the conversation. You mentioned Kyron, Walker, and McCaffrey maybe being your top three of this group. The only other guy I would maybe argue should be in that conversation is Jonathan Taylor. And I'm curious why you left him out. So 25-year-old Jonathan Taylor has kind of ebbed and flowed with how that offensive line has worked in Indianapolis, right? His first two seasons were incredible. He was looking like that next great back. Then dealt with some injuries, also just you know poor quarterback play, poor offensive line play in Indianapolis kind of hampered what he could do in 2022, 2023, but the situation should be getting better, right? Anthony Richardson comes back healthy this year. Hopefully that offensive line is healthy this year, new coaching staff, right? You start to like what's going on there a lot more. Again, he's still 25. So he's two years younger than Saquon. He's a year younger than Josh Jacobs. This is a guy that probably fits into that three-year window of if I'm betting on the next three years, he should be fine, right? So is he somebody that we're comfortable leaving out of the next group that we're discussing? I have him just outside of that top three, because I think like you mentioned, his performance has ebbed and flowed basically with how his offensive line has performed. 
right? When you saw kind of the dominance and like when someone like Quentin Nelson was at the top of his game, uh, you know, three, four years ago before he kind of had a couple, I think, foot and ankle injuries or what have you, and it's kind of been bothered the last two years. That's when Taylor was elite. He hasn't been that. So we've seen him kind of ebb and flow with his situation. And while I think he gets a bit of a boost with, uh, with uh, Richardson coming back at quarterback and they, uh, they added some weapons uh, through the draft on offense. I, I have him behind those three because I think he's shown to be a bit more dependent on his surroundings than the promise that those two young guys have shown and the fact that we know what we're going to get with McCaffrey if and when he's on the field. So he's he's ebbed and flow with the situation. He's also missed some time with injury. So I think that's why I leave him out of the top three of this tier, but he's in that group of the next names following those three. So I think those three are the top of tier two. And then I'd, I'd have Taylor in, in that mix, maybe as the next guy up behind them. Um, and that's that. I, I just don't have enough... I don't have enough comfort in putting him with those other three names. I think it's clear that you have the the young upside potential with those two guys, Walker and Kyron, and then you have the certainty with McCaffrey for, let's just say, one year. And then after that, you go, okay, what's next? And then what's next is where someone like Taylor comes in and some of these other names. But I don't think that's clear cut enough to put them in tier three. I think that they're still tier two backs. Mm-hmm. Um just not my favorite tier two backs. Okay, so let's start with that top group. McCaffrey, Kyron, and Walker. Um, Walker last year, I feel like people were kind of downgrading him because of the Charbonnet pick, uh, but we talked about that, right? It didn't really hamper what they were asking him to do. Maybe just took a little load off of him, which is actually a benefit for you know your player staying healthy. Uh, this year, Kyron Williams, same thing kind of happens to him when they go and draft Blake Corum. I kind of feel the same way about it. I don't think this is somebody we have to be necessarily worried about. If anything, I think that they are both valuable players in all 22, but Kyron still should be the lead back considering what he's proved he's able to do. Um, I struggle really choosing between the two. I think if it was me just from a pure prospect perspective and what I've seen so far, I like Walker better. Um, I think he's just more elusive. He can do more as a receiver. Kyron is really really good at what they're asking him to do, but I think it's a little also scheme dependent as he's in that McVay offense. They're going to make it work no matter what. I don't know if he leaves, if that's still going to really be a thing. Right. And that, that worries me a little bit in terms of long-term success. So for me, I think it would be Walker. And then it's pretty close between Kyron and McCaffrey. Like I, the upside of what you're getting in McCaffrey is so up and above everybody else that it's almost more valuable to just take that, but also considering running backs are much lower value. The difference in terms of weekly points may not be effective enough to risk that six years of difference in age, right. Between McCaffrey and some of these other guys. So I'll leave it to you. I think if it was me, it'd be Walker, Kyron McCaffrey, but curious what you think. I would do. I would do Walker, Kyron, McCaffrey in that order because it's not so much splitting the hairs between the two remaining names of Kyron and McCaffrey. It's more so at what point do I say, okay, I'm done taking, I'm done considering age and taking the young guys. And now I'm just going to take who's going to be really good for me in 2024. And then I worry about running back either through the rookie draft next year or in some other form or fashion. So I still have those two young names, then McCaffrey. And then at that point, it's just one of those deals where it's like, if I don't also have Derek Henry in that same conversation, am I saying that I believe he's going to fall off this year? Because if I'm only putting McCaffrey up here because he's going to be so good and I'm only worried about what he looks like for me next year, then if I don't put Henry up there, am I saying Henry's not going to be that great next year? I think he is. So I think he also comes up here. And I think Henry and Taylor are probably the next two names. Wow. It's hard because, yeah, like I think if I had to project, I would say like Mc- you're getting the high upside in both, right? You're going to get solid grading with McCaffrey and Henry throughout the year. High level. Every game's going to be better than everybody else. Yes. But I think McCaffrey probably plays 15 games. I think Henry could play 10 and I think that's a pretty big difference. And those two years matter. Like they do matter. 
Henry has a lot of wear and tear on his body. I would just be so surprised if he was able to stay healthy enough to play a full 16, 17 games. He did it last year. It's true. <laughs> uh, I mean, would it be the biggest surprise, though, if McCaffrey is the one who plays just 10 games? He was just on the cover of Madden. Uh, no, but I mean, in in he's he's done that before. He's had those stretches of, of his career where he's missed a lot of time with injury. There was like a two or three year period where people were so frustrated because he was so good, but he just wasn't on the field for them. And it cost a lot of people in their leagues. So again, it's like whatever you could say about McCaffrey, good or bad. I feel like you could say about Henry too. Uh, I, like they, 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 they just might both be the Trent Williams is of running back. When you're 29, you're basically 36 uh, at running back. And so McCaffrey in his case is like 35. So I just, yeah, I, I can't, I can't make the argument for one over the other as far as excluding the other. Cause well, here, here's the, say the same thing. Here's They're productive the and have injury history. Here's the argument. Would it surprise you at all if McCaffrey played three more seasons? Would it surprise me? Sure, if he played three more seasons, but in 2026, I'm out on him regardless. Sure. He could look fantastic in 25. I'm out will on him he in 26. Be it, would it be surprising if Henry played two more seasons? No, I think two is the number. I think really? he has you a think, great year okay. this year, and then I think it, that's he slows down, and I think that's it. Okay, all right. So then we're, we're just not going to agree on that. So let's include Henry in the conversation. I think based on the what we talked about, right, I think Jacobs, Saquon also need to be in the conversation. I think Jonathan Taylor needs to be in the conversation. I think that at this point we need Turning into a big tier. It's that's the issue, right? And I haven't even made my argument for Joe Mixon yet. Oh um, God. I have, <laughs> I have Joe Mixon in the, the Saquon tier. So I like, I, I agree that he's really valuable, but I, I, about I think it's fair. I, yeah. I think it's fair to say would you would you think it's fair to say that putting aside how we feel about Henry and McCaffrey, mm -hmm. right? I think I think what we're getting to is I think it's fair to say that we could put McCaffrey above Henry. Uh, outside of that, after we sort through those two names, that Taylor is next on the list above the Saquon, the Jacobs, unless yes. you want to make a case for the rookies. No, I, th I think it's clear, and that would put him at seven. Okay. So we're going to put Taylor at seven. I'm in agreement there. I'm, I'm happy we got that one out of the way. But I think that I could make an argument if we're going to start talking about Saquon, Jacobs, and Henry, that a guy like Pacheco, who's graded extremely well, is 24 years old, like that 82 grading is high enough for me to be like, hey, I'm starting to buy into this. He's young enough. He's good enough that I'm buying in. The situation's awesome, that he should be in this conversation. I think A-Chain as a rookie at 22 years old now he's playing you know he's 22 now for him to grade in the 90s as a rookie is interesting enough that it's worth the risk right where the injury stuff super concerning i'm terrified of it i even think that there's a good chance that he splits carries with right at some point very soon but is the upside just so high that it's worth taking the risk early on because it is a, not a valuable position right it's like if you're going to go for if you're going to take a risk like this on any position, it's kind of running back. They they drafted uh, A-Chan in the third round last year. Yep. This year they drafted right, was it the third or fourth round? Fourth. Fourth round this year. Next year they're going to draft another guy who weighs like 195 pounds and runs a 4-3 in the third or fourth round. They're just going to continue to do this. So I can't, I can't, I just can't. And also like that efficiency is so hard to replicate. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's very hard to replicate, but given that we know, and again, I know we're not volume based, but I don't know. At some point, can you go to a summary? I, yeah. Yeah. Just go to the summary because I think you make a good point. Right. But it, it's kind of a double-edged sword Any where hurt. I think that, yeah, the, the injury stuff is what scares me, but I think that there is an argument that he will continue to be successful because I think that they will just choose how to use him, right? Like the, right. the efficiency stuff, they might only give him 25 carries a game or 25 snaps a game for that matter. Snaps, right? yeah, carries, snaps a game. I wish. 25 snaps a game. But those 
25 snaps and the 10 carries they give him are going to be so valuable because they know exactly how to use him. That's what I think they continue doing. I'll make this easy. Let's put, I think we can put Jacobs and Saquon at the bottom of this tier. I might let you have HN in this tier because I get, I get it. That I mean, you just you just described what I do, which right. is just yeah, just chase the home run. But also, like, there's other guys. Like, I'm like, over this here. is just one of the arguments, right? But like you mentioned, Trey Benson, like or, no. or we're not with him in this tier at 21 years old. I don't think he's that level of player. Okay, what about Etienne and Brooks? Are the other two guys? I think. I feel like we've seen Etienne's high watermark. And it's not I that think, high, right? And it's it's fine. I think this is what he's going to be. Mm-hmm. I think 77, high 7, I think this is what he's going to be. He's going to be a solid, probably finish around RB9 and 10, which is fine. It's good. But I don't I don't see anything beyond that. I think it's good. Um, what takes the next step, yeah, what takes what takes the next step in, in Jacksonville as far as that offense is concerned, like the improvements are going to be made through the air, I think. I think he just is what he is. And it's good. It's very good. That's a starter, right? You're in 12 team league. He's RB nine. That's someone starting back and you're counting on this player, but I don't, I don't see the, the upside there too great as well as some of these other players have. Um, what about a yeah. Brooks then? Well, uh, Brooks, the, I, I got to see it off the injury. I, everyone loves Brooks because he's still 20 years old and the Panthers signed a couple guards, but, still tore his knee up in November. If yeah. I'm wasting a year on running back, which is basically what this is going to be, this is, he's not going to be back to himself or whatever version of himself will be moving forward until 2025. I don't like that. We're talking about a short lifespan here. I put him at the top ish of tier three. Okay. All right. So let's do that. Then we got a chain, Saquon Jacobs and Henry in this next conversation, right? To me, it's, it's Jacobs because I know you're not going to give me a chain. So I think it's Jacobs for me. 26 years. I'll old. give you a chain before I give you Jacobs. Wow. Okay. I didn't expect yeah. that. I didn't expect that, yeah. but I mean, tw- yeah. Okay. So I'll make the argument for a chain then 22 years old. Great situation. Great running back coach. Extremely friendly in that regard. The offensive line stinks, but it doesn't, it almost doesn't, doesn't matter, matter. And it's really never mattered there with that kind of a coaching tree. Um, he's extremely production and they're just going to use him in ways that he can be successful. So I really like that. And it's something I'm willing to take a risk on because again, it's a low value position. You might be able to get this guy. You're talking about maybe around like 20. So like, why not? Yeah, no, you're right. I think, I think that's, that's the way, because like you mentioned, we're talking running back. It's a low, the reason it's a low value position is because, of supply and demand. A good runner is not necessarily that hard to find and you don't have to spend big money to get one. Mm -hmm. That's what the NFL has told you. And that's reflected in all 22. So if you are going to get one, what differentiates the one you have versus anybody else? You'd like a difference maker. Devon Ajan has proven to differentiate himself with his efficiency and explosiveness in the offense that he's in. You just say, okay, can he stay healthy? And, and if he does, then maybe he'll lose some of that efficiency because it was absurd last year, but you still see, you still have that home run breakaway ability. And if it doesn't go right, well, then you could pick from the scrap heap of every other running back that's there. Cause like we just said, there's a lot of supply. Okay. All right. A chain at eight. That's crazy. Okay. Love it. So after him, the sake, the Saquon, the Jacobs, the Derrick Henry conversation goes back into effect. You gave me that. I'll give you the next one. I think it's easy enough to say neither of those three are long-term type of uh, projections at running back. They're on the older side for running back. So just go which with which one should be producing the best in the near term. And that to me is Derrick Henry. Uh, and then you're going to say Jacobs and I'm going to say Saquon for after Henry. Um, but I think, I think that I think Saquon's situation got so much, even if Saquon just went to like an average situation, it would have been so much better than what he's been dealing with. He went to Philadelphia. I think that's, I think it's a huge boon for him. He's, he produced his best despite the offensive line being horrendous from the moment he came into the league, 
because they at least had a weapon on the outside in Odell Beckham back when he first came into the league and he had some semblance of space to work with. And we saw what he did his rookie year. After that, it was just, it was just a wasteland in New York. Now he goes to Philadelphia while he may not have that same spring in his legs he had in 2018 when he was 21 years old. He's got two weapons on the outside, a running quarterback to open things up and a good offensive line. All he's ever had in his career was one weapon for a short time and we saw what he did. So I think to me, all of that coming together, I think can spell a huge breakout year for Saquon Barkley in 2024. We talk about how centers being a low value position, but they're kind of like linebackers where although they're a lower value position, they kind of like run the show of their group, right? Like linebackers basically run the defense. Centers kind of run the offensive line. Losing Jason Kelsey, I think, is a very underrated thing in Philadelphia. Like, I'm very nervous that that one loss takes away a lot of the the allure of going to Philly, right? This is a this is a team that does a great job backfilling and always has a guy that is going to step in and be all right. But we're talking about losing like a Hall of Fame center. That matters a little bit to me. It does. And, J- and again, I think the conversation with Jacobs is it's a similar thing. He's going from a poor situation to a really good one. The difference between the two guys, Jacobs has graded extremely high throughout his career. Saquon hasn't. But, but we saw a decline last year. But he Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm just saying. I'm just because I was gonna be like, who is this quarterback? And then you were gonna be like, Daniel Jones? Yeah. I'm not gonna have that conversation. Or whoever even what was it, Tyrod after Jones? So Danny Dimes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You want Saquon, I'll give you Saquon. You want Saquon at 10? Jacobs at eleven. We're gonna do that. Lock it in. Saquon 10, Jacobs eleven. They can all direct their hate to me. I don't care. They and I bet they will. Um, okay. So that next well. Because I still have guys for my tier two, right? But there is Who? Etienne, Jonathan Brooks, Isaiah Pacheco. Oh, yeah, 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 fine, 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 fine. So there's S2, those three, four fine. guys. Then Joe Mixon is the only guy left in my tier three before we get into tier four. But do you want me to tell you my tier four? Because there might be guys in there that you're like, that guy should be in there. So are we settled on this being tier two and then your tier two guys we're going to discuss in tier three? Is that what we're saying? Yes. Okay. Give me a couple tier, tier, your tier four guys then. Uh, James Cook, Tony Pollard, DeAndre Swift. I'm just giving the guys that I think might be like towards the top of the conversation. Aaron Jones, Alvin Kamara, James Conner, Stevenson in uh, New England. Zamir White in Vegas, Rashad White in Tampa Bay. Those are the guys that I think like would be maybe pushing the top of that group. I left out other guys that I think are towards the yeah. bottom of that group. And you wanted to stretch this this episode to 32. Um, there's only one name from that tier four group, I or maybe two, that I think can be considered. And that's DeAndre Swift and it's uh, Aaron Jones. And I get Jones's age, but I think it goes back to the argument that we had before as it relates to, hey, short term, I still think he's going to grade very well. I know there's a quarterback question here. I'm just looking to see if there's any other names that pop up. I think we got them all. I think Jones, I still like the way they run the ball in the system in Minnesota to where I think Aaron Jones is going to be very productive there because Whenever he's been on the field, he's been great. It's just Green Bay didn't give him the ball a ton. And then every now and again, he'd come up with like a little bit of a, like a sprained knee or something and be a little hobbled, maybe miss a game or two. And just never quite had that solid like, hey, you're the guy. Go for it. I think whenever they've, but I think in important games, Green Bay has always leaned on him and he has always produced. And I think he's still got that. He's still got some of that left in him this coming season in Minnesota for sure. I don't think I could, I don't, I don't know, but he's one of my guys and he always has been. So I understand why someone might have him in tier four, but I, I, I would have him in tier three. Okay. I mean, I'm willing to talk about it. I think the guy for me that is pretty interesting is cook. I think people like really like cook. I'm just really not one of those people. Like I, I, 
he's just not my guy. I understand he's done pretty well. He's still on that rookie contract. He's just not my guy. So let's talk about the group of guys we have right now for that tier three, which is Travis Etienne, Jonathan Brooks, Isaiah Pacheco, Trey Benson, Joe Mixon, DeAndre Swift, and Aaron Jones. For me, it's clear that this is the point where I would chase youth and I would go after those young guys. Um, I think Brooks and Benson, again, they're still 20 and 21 years old. I understand the knee injury, yada, yada, yada. It's still five years of age difference between them and even the next guys we're talking about. I think Pacheco, for me, the thing that I worry about him, I'm not sure he's second contract good. And if he's not second contract good and he's not in Kansas City anymore, I he loses almost all the allure for me. And he's going into, I think, year three or four of that contract. So again, it's like, if I'm only really getting one or two years of him in Kansas City, probably moves him to the bottom of this group for me. Although he has been really good, right? He's been a very productive player. Um, again, I just don't know if he's second contract good. And I don't think Kansas City's in a position where they'd want to pay a second contract running back. Correct. And I don't think wherever he goes, I don't think he will be. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get a big contract. I mean, we've seen more higher end talent this past free agency cycle, not get big money. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he's going to be the guy for a next team or go into a better situation than he's in already given that offense. So yeah, that's okay. why like some people are screaming, like look at how good Pacheco is. And yeah, but that right. that's fine for now. Exactly. So I think you've kind of convinced me that the, and you might not even have realized you did this, but the next tier for me, I think, that we should talk about the four guys are Brooks, Benson, Etienne, and Swift. Because I think all of those guys are either in really good situations or have enough of their career left that the upside is just too valuable. For me, I think the guy would be Etienne because he's still young. And I think he might be a second contract guy in Jacksonville because he's been good enough. They like him. I think he's a good locker room guy. Um, and again, we always talk about how it's just hard for them to just get talent into the building. So when you have talent that wants to be there and that you trust, sign them, right? Keep them around. For me, he's that guy. I would take the risk on him first. I think after that, it might be Swift because that we know the high upside play that can be had there. And you like the situation in Chicago, but it's really close between him and Brooks in my, in my mind. Ah, oh, man. Um, I think Etienne, I'm just not as convinced as you, as you are about how long Etienne will be there. Cause I think he could be on the same timeline as actually, no. Yeah. I, I guess he could be on the same timeline in the sense that he can get a fifth year option mm -hmm. from, from Jacksonville and then play out those last two years and then be a free, I think he could be done after that. Cause then he's going to be heading into his age 27, 28 season. I'm not as convinced that they're going to sign him to a big deal. Given that I don't see enough here to convince me to take him over one of these young guys, because while Swift is entering a good situation, it wasn't bad in, in, in Philadelphia. And was he was, he was just okay. He wasn't that great. He had a high watermark in 2022, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So I think now is where I take the swing on the rookies. And it's just a matter of how comfortable are you with the Brooks injury and maybe him starting slow um, and not being the best version of himself in 2024 versus Benson, a little bit, you know, a year older, not as much draft capital, but the situation itself is is a bit better and a bit more clear cut in that you have Connor there, but it's not long-term. They got some weapons or they're getting more weapons on the outside in Arizona. Um, you know, they're going to keep working that offensive line uh, for improvements as well. I think it's between those two names and I could be swayed either, either way. What's interesting too, is what I didn't mention because I'm the guy who like, I don't like torn knees. They both have torn knees in their history. Benson was just a couple years ago versus Brooks being last November. Uh, it's a toss up, but I think I would lean Brooks yeah, because I like to take the long-term view, but it's close. It's close for me, but I think the next two names are these rookies before we get into Etienne and Swift. So Brooks is next for me. And it's almost interesting because you, when you look at style of running backs that are at the top of our licks, list with Bijan, Gibbs, McCaffrey, right? Like those types of runners, that's more of what Brooks is, right? Like that's kind of his style. He's very elusive. 
He's he's a lateral, uh, can make you miss any type of way kind of guy. We'll see how the knee injury affects that. But to me, that's that's the high end runner that I'm usually looking for. Benson is more in the big body mold where yes, he has speed and agility, but he's going to overpower you too. So which means he's going to take a lot more contact, right? So I think for me, it's Brooks at 12. It's Benson at 13. I'm going to go ahead and fight again for Etienne being 14. And then I would say Swift at maybe... Oh, am I taking Swift over Mixon and Pacheco? Probably not. Yeah, I think Etienne, Etienne is, is the next name. And then you have the discussion between Swift, Pacheco, and Mixon. Okay, let's do that yeah. then. For me, it's Pacheco, Mixon, Swift. Looking for your rebuttal. <laughs> I've always been a big Mixon guy. I could totally see why you would have Pacheco first. And I I would also have Pacheco first, I think. But I mean, just just take a look at this card here. And this is with uh, you know, running behind guys like Jonah Williams and you know, just a, an admittedly bad offensive line for many years. And now he goes to Houston, which is a fantastic situation. I love their running scheme, love their running style. I think he's much more talented than, um, than uh, oh my gosh, blank name. This is what happens when Pacheco. you have a, a baby with a cold who keeps you up all night. No, 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 no. Runner in Houston that everybody loved two years ago that, that got oh, a lot oh of carries. Um, yeah, give me a second. Like I have the, it written down here. Pierce, Damian Pierce. Damian Pierce, yes. I was like, I know it's not Damian Williams. That's a different guy. It was Damian Pierce. Yeah, I think he's much more talented than Damian Pierce. And, and has been always. And now mm. that he's going into that situation, I think there's a very good chance he just goes buck wild this year. Uh, and I'm talking strictly on the field. Um, so I think he could be a top six type of running back for 2024 this season. Then he's going to be 29. And at that point, all bets are off. But this is this is very good here. This is, this is a lot of green in a pretty poor run blocking situation for most of his career. Mm -hmm. And now he goes to a fantastic system. Okay. So we're going to go very high on it. We're going to go Pacheco. Then we're going to go mix in. So that's 15 and 16. Am I good to lock Swift in at 17? Yeah. I don't see another name here that okay. really goes, goes nuts. I mean, yeah, I think that's it. If someone like Marshawn Lloyd gets a, gets a huge opportunity in green Bay for, you know, due to an injury or something, which you don't want to have happen. I like him a lot and maybe he becomes something, but you can't bank okay. on that. So the next tiers are, this is where it gets extremely hard at running back, right? Because the tier four for me, I said some of the names already, but it's guys that are starters, but basically they're just starters. That's the only reason you're, you're valuing them. They don't excite you. There's not this high upside. You know what they are. Uh, and that's that's James Cook, that's Tony Pollard, that's Najee Harris, that's Javante Williams, Rashad White, Samir White, Devin Singletary, Alvin Kamara, James Conner, St Ramadre Stevenson, and Aaron Jones, right? Like there's that group of guys where any single one of them could have a good year, but they're never going to grade higher than 85, almost definitely, right? Then we talk about the tier fives I have. I actually have two tier fives. There's tier five A and tier five B. Tier five A is... <laughs> Nick Chubb, Jalen Warren, Jerome Ford, Zach Charbonnet, uh, Brian Robinson Jr., David Montgomery, Gus Edwards, uh, Moss on the Bengals, Zach Moss, and Miles Sanders, right? It's this type of running back that they're probably in a more work share type situation, but they're good football players and they're going to be good, consistent football players for you basically no matter what. But then tier 5B is the list of the young guys, right? It's Blake Corum, it's Marshawn Lloyd, it's Jalen Wright. Bucky Irving, Will Shipley, Guerrero, uh, uh, Allen, Tracy, and Vidal, right? It's like this group of guys where we absolutely have no idea what any of them are. And there's a good chance that like 90% of that group just is out of the league in two years. But are you willing to bet on those guys over, right? So like, do you either want the starters that you know are starters? Do you want the backups or guys that are maybe like starters, but in a more of a work share, but you know what they are? Or do you want the guys that are just the high upside rookies, right? You need to make that decision before we move on. And to me, it was tier four, four. I would go with those starters, right? I would go with the James Cooks, the Tony Pollards, the Najee Harris, the Javante Williams. Open to debating that. I think Jalen Warren can have a very good season this year. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how long that would last for how many years because he doesn't have the capital, the pedigree, et cetera, et cetera. But I think he can have a very good season 
there's always been those murmurs and rumors floating around Pittsburgh about Najee Harris. I tend to think he will be on the roster come opening day. Um, but I'm not sure he's going to be the, the featured guy like he has been. Ramondre Stevenson also intrigues me, set to be the guy in New England. Again, don't think he's going to be amazing or fantastic or anything like that, but uh, I think he's got a clear role, and I kind of like what he did um, before missing some time late in the year. In a bad situation overall, it was just a bad offense, but he was clearly better than than Zeke, which isn't saying much. But I think with with his role, I think he can have a good year as well. So I'm just going to pick out the names that intrigue me from that list, yep. which I already mentioned Aaron Jones for for yep. for those reasons I explained. I like Jalen Warren. I like Ramondre Stevenson. And then just going back up the list, uh, I had him up here for a bit, but Tony Pollard, he's ranked pretty high up uh, in our algorithm rankings. And that's because I think after week 10, he was like running back three in the NFL, you know, grading wise. I mean, you see some pretty high end games there to close out the last month of the season, but he ended the season very strongly. And I think a lot of people forget that because the first impression of him in 2024 wasn't very good. He wasn't the same guy he was in 2023, but you have to remember in that playoff game against San Francisco to close out the 2022 season, he like broke his ankle and it, it was pretty nasty and ugly. And while he didn't miss time on the field, he wasn't the same guy until later on in the year. And so those, those high marks that we saw in 2021 and 2022, that guy started to come back after Thanksgiving in in 2023 now he's in tennessee and the offensive line isn't quite as good but they've invested some pieces there and again we talked about callahan and how much we like him so i think at this point i think he should be one of the first names to uh in this next tier that that we slot in here because again he was ascending here we've seen what he can do before and I think it was more so a matter of him just getting back to his old self after that broken ankle than, than him just really declining as a player, which I think there's some of that naturally. He's 27 now. But again, prior to this, he was like a top six grader at running back overall in the NFL, and he was producing very well uh, those other two years in 2021 and 2022. So I think he has to be up here. He's really intriguing as a, as a sleeper option for 2024. Okay, so I, I think the only other names that I would want to throw in are the Whites, Zamir White and Rashad White, the Whites. And <laughs> <laughs> you could cut that. Um, I'm, I'm not, um, only because we're uh, that. That's a funny comedian that you just quoted. It was a right. quote, guys. It was a quote. Um, I, I just don't know if enough people know that, right? And I'm going to be on blast. All right, Rashad White, Zamir White. Rashad White in Tampa Bay has been extremely productive, done a great job, not high end scoring, but just solid. Uh, I, I think his situation is basically secure there where again, for his rookie contract, he will likely be the starter, but not a second contract guy there for Zamir White. It's also interesting because they basically have nothing else to throw out on to the field. So is he just going to get so much opportunity? We saw what Josh Jacobs could do in that situation. You hope that, you know, the, the all around play of the team gets better after, you know, a new head coach. I don't know if it will, but I think I'm at least intrigued by Zamir white and the, the young age that he has and what he has to offer there. I am so out on both of those guys. Um, I could maybe be talked into like backfilling this tier with Zamir white, mm -hmm. but I am so out on Rashad white. I like, I, I can't express enough. Why? Because he just has, there's, he's just, he, I don't think he brings anything extra to the table at all. I think, I think he's so replaceable. I think he's, he's just, you look at Rashad White and it's like, okay, you're six foot, 214 pounds. You have like the size. That's it. He's got the size and the build and everything else is completely average. We've heard our friends, Sam and Steve use this uh, metaphor before, I believe with Tyrell Williams, where he was like 6'4", 215 or something. And it's like, if you go to Madden and you create a player and you put his size into like the prototype size you want, and then you just leave everything else at 65, that is Rashad White. Just, just nothing extra. Just everything 
outside of his build is just completely baseline, just ordinary, uninspiring. Like I just, yeah, I can't, I, I can't be more out. But there's nothing there threatening his situation that concerns me. And then they get Bucky Irving. Oh my God. There's nothing there in that now situation gonna... that concerns me. Um, he and also I think that you're, you're, Peyton Barber. you're underestimating that. I think Rashad white has a little bit of like burst and second effort after contact that I like. It's not Isaiah Pacheco good, but it has reminiscence of that where it's this extra effort that they want to see, right? Like that's something that you buy into as a team and as a coach, a guy that's going to give you that second effort, but fine. We'll, we'll push them to the end. <laughs> but fine. I, so condescendingly. Yeah, because I, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with you. And I, I mean, Jalen Warren, I, I feel like it's the same kind of thing. It's like, what does he offer besides that, right? Like there is this second effort into his into his game that I like, right? But I don't think he's super elusive. I don't think he he's a great receiving back. There's nothing that I think that really, really stands out and solidifies him as this next guy. Also, he's 5'8", so... I, I, would, so, I don't care if he's 5'8", short king out there. Um, look, when I watch Jalen Warren run, I don't have to go, oh, I wonder if it rained a ton last night because he looks like he's stuck in mud. That's what I see when I see Rashad White. I'm just like, wow, this must be a really slow track. No, it's just Rashad White mm-hmm. uh, just kind of galloping out there and not really gaining much ground. Uh, I I think Jalen Warren is is much more – I think there's much more upside with Jalen Warren. I think he can. he's a bit more of a breakaway back. I like him after contact. I I am so I I couldn't disagree with you more. I like Jalen Warren so much more than Rashad White. It's probably because I'm. I think I'm it's a evident Nashi in guy. this grading right here. I think look at this grade. Jalen Warren just just pure as a pure runner was eighth in the league. Go to last weekly year. summary. Go to weekly summary on him. Oh my gosh! Go to weekly summary. The, the whole point is that that's what's changing, and that's still not bad. It's not There's bad. Some blue in there. Some green. Yeah, it's, it's not, not bad. bad. It's not bad. Not bad. And I'm still bought in on Najee. And that's what, like, I get it. Like, that's your, I, if that's your problem. That's my problem. Because I think that Najee is a more true traditional style running back, but he's really good at it. They just don't have an offense. They didn't have an offensive line to no, do they that. Didn't. They do now, right? Like, they've done enough now where I say, and, and Arthur Smith, right? Where it's like, <laughs> that's probably the direction they move in. That's more Najee to me. And again, this isn't bad. People, people dump on Najee Harris. 78 grade is good, right? Like that's, that's better than some of the guys we've already ranked. And you look at like the week to week, it's not bad either. So I'm still bought in and in that Najee Harris can be an effective running back. And I think that he's good enough where I don't think Warren just steals the show from him. I also don't think they give Warren first and second down. I think they give that to Najee still, unless they trade Najee. And if they trade Najee and it's true that like, Hey, the Cowboys are interested that just raises his stock to me, but uh, that's not that's not the conversation. So that was again Najee Harris. Uh, so I they think Stevenson, Jones, and Pollard are the next three that we can at least agree to to discuss here. I think for me, it's probably Pollard because of all the reasons you said. Right, the situation he's still the starter. They signed him to be the starter. They've invested in the offensive line. The coaching is offensive line heavy. He's produced at a very high level before. He's only twenty seven, so he's not that much older than. Uh, Stevenson, who's 26 already, but he is a couple of years younger than Aaron Jones, right? So I think I give him the nod as the next guy, and we're only at 18. Holy cow! So he's 18, 2024. 20, that's it. And then Aaron, or then for me it would be Stevenson, and then Aaron Jones. Do you do you debate those two at all? I would have Jones, but that's personal preference. And I could totally understand Stevenson. I'm I'm a fan of Stevenson as well. So, so I'm going to trump don't have you on that one. And we're going to go Stevenson at 19 and Aaron Jones at 20. So we have four spots left if we're only going to do the top 24. And it looks like just based on time that that's what we're going to have to do. So you have Warren in the conversation. I think it's hard to leave Cook out just because, again, fantastic situation. Not a lot of competition there, even though there are guys I like. Uh, Ray Davis, right? But I think Cook, Warren, Javante, Najee. I mean, there's people probably shouting about Kamara, right? Like we haven't talked about him. You talk about these older guys that continue to grade well. He is one of those, right? And he's only 29. He's the same age as Aaron Jones. Um, James Conner, again, 29, still producing at a very high level. But I think I probably would want to go towards some of these younger guys. I think Jalen Wright is so intriguing to me. Uh, Blake Corum has some intrigue as well, because if he ends up splitting carries with uh, Kyron, I think that he can absolutely feast. 
and both of those guys, Quorum and Wright, are the two guys that I think I would probably bet on just because I think that there are carries that they can pull and be extremely, extremely effective in all 22. But Nick Chubb, we haven't talked about him. The injury stuff's too scary, I think, to include him this low. <sighs> Gus Edwards has, has just been awesome. Like, and he's now probably the starter in uh, Los Angeles for the Chargers. David Montgomery's been really good. Yeah, I think he has to be considered. I mean, he 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 did not perform as well late in the year, and I think his role probably starts to slip more and more towards Gibbs. Mm-hmm. But is that necessarily a bad thing? I think he still has enough of a role to be relevant as far as snaps go in all twenty-two. So if he just does what he does well, I think he could be on the back end of this thing. But just a name to throw out there, I think I think I to agree. your point, it's it goes back to what we kind of said a little bit earlier. It's like, okay, we we've kind of named and established all the difference makers here, and now it's the soup. We got like a veteran soup here of guys that could be something, you know, have have done a few nice things, but we know it's not going to be for very long if they do uh, hit the upper tier of their, you know. Uh, projectable outcomes here in 2024 and maybe 2025 and we're just kind of stuck there right so I, I can be swayed a lot in this tier i just lean towards again what you said about some of these young guys to where someone like jalen wright is obviously very intriguing they're obviously going to give him the role in some capacity given that they drafted him in the fourth round um it's just, again, how does that fit in with guys like Mostert and, of course, A-Chan? And then it's just which rookie that kind of has some intrigue gets a big opportunity here, whether that's a Marshawn Lloyd. I don't know. It's just, it's it just depends. I think it's you think Quorum. it's who? I think it's Blake Corum. And, and we forget, too, that he, before his injury, he was grading in college as high as like any prospect we've ever seen. I just also get that he's not prototypical, like, NFL size. So it's, it's a little bit hard, right. To just like say that he's going to be successful. But I think to me, I have five guys for these last four spots. I think it's James cook. I think it's Jalen Warren. It's David Montgomery. It's Blake Corum and it's Jalen, Wright. <laughs> Alvin Kamara has been good. That's why it's hard. He's been really good. He's 29. I, I, is, is it just me? This just feels like the year where it's just going to really come apart for the saints. I feel have we talked about this? I feel like we have, we have, we have. We talked about it because you were talking yeah. about um, Chris Olave, maybe. I don't remember. But yeah, we were basically Olave, like... Car, whoever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it just feels like this is... They've been running on a credit card for a while. Their best players on defense have gotten older. It just just feels like this is... Like, they're running out of steam here. And I the think thing that, that stinks. Kamara. The thing that stinks, Ray, is they draft the guys I like. Every draft, I'm like, well, that's, my, that's, that's my dude. dude. Chris Olave, Brian Brisset... Uh, we talked about the edge rusher from Notre Dame I'm trying to remember his name, Foskey Foskey, right? Like those are guys that I'm like, wow. Like if I was, if I was drafting a guy in the third round, I would draft Foskey, right? Like that's a great pick. I think they've done a lot of that and it's kind of held them above water, right? They've been successful because they, they hit on some guys like that, but you're right. I think it's starting to kind of come apart. Yeah. Who I think I would put cook, I think first, because okay. well, I don't love it he's not necessarily threatened and he has performed kind of well, mm -hmm. but again, I mean, we're, we're in the twenties here, so I'm not yep. going to be in love with anything we really say here because I do think a, a large bit of this is kind of propped up by that great game, insane game he had versus the Cowboys at home late in the year. Um, you see a lot of duds kind of mixed in there, but you know, do again, we not think, do we not think Javante Williams is going to come back at all? Or is that situation just so bad that it's... I think he's just going to be okay. I just think it's uninspiring. I think yeah. he's going to be fine. I think I think there's a possibility for more production in a standard format than in all 22 because I don't think he's going to be able to take any games over. I mm -hmm. think the offense as a whole is going to struggle. So I don't think efficiency is going to be great there. But he's going to get volume. And that's something. I think mm -hmm. it's enough to where if you need an RB2 for some reason in a given week due to injury or what have you, you could put him in there. He's not going to kill you. Yeah. But but I don't I don't see the any game-breaking ability here because the offense is just not where it needs to be. It's, it's just not inspiring. So well, I think it's more volume than anything else. Before we solidify our final three guys, can you just pull up one more card, and that's Brian Robinson Jr. 
He's also 25. I feel like many men. if we're talking about Jalen Warren, we have to talk about Robinson Jr. Because Robinson Jr. is the starter in that situation. Also oh, super yeah. undervalued. Graded out 75.3 last year, 82.5 the year before. He is the starter there. This should probably be a guy that makes this list. Uh, and the reason, one argument I'll make for that, right? We're talking about David Montgomery. The reason I was so high on Gibbs is because I think Gibbs this year takes over that situation. Montgomery, 27. I could see him starting to take a sec, a more of a secondary role, where I'm not sure every week he's meeting snap count minimums and things like that. So I think I feel more comfortable with a guy like Brian Robinson Jr. over a Montgomery. I'm not saying either of them ultimately makes our final three, but but I think that's an argument that I could I could definitely make there. I mean, I know he's like old, but Eckler's still there. Oh, like, get I think here. he eats some of it. Like, I think he eats think some so of that all. share. You think he's done, done? I don't think I he's, done, he's done, done, but like, we're talking about maybe. <sighs> yeah, no, I think he's done. I think Eckler's done. And I really like Eckler. And that's why it's hard for me to say that. Cause like, he's a dude that I've rooted for his entire career, pound for pound, right? Like, that's kind of the guys we go for. But he's, I think he's done. So the to support your argument a bit further with with Jaden Daniels there, given Robinson Jr.'s size and kind of his style of a downhill runner and how some of that could be opened up by Daniels in Washington in the run game, it kind of goes back to why everyone's excited about Derrick Henry and why someone like Gus Edwards was successful in in Baltimore. It's kind of that same style of play there. It it helps guys like this. Okay, I, I could see him in this. I could see him in the top twenty-four. I think. I think that's. I think that's a good argument. And I think I take right. him over Warren. And that's kind of like the point I'm trying to make. Is like I think I'm he has. Somebody. I think he had. He's produced better already. I think he's proven that he can do it with more being a bell cow than Warren ever will be asked to do. And they're the same age. Actually, I think Robinson's a little younger. To me, if I'm choosing one of them to make this list, it's Robinson. Well, we, I, why not both? Because I think that I don't know if I can leave Corman right off the list. You can leave Corum off this list. It's okay. You think so? Like you have more faith on Warren and I like Corum. having a great career at 20, you know, he's going to be 26, finally getting his opportunity or Corum being 23, getting an opportunity and having some great years. I'm just saying that we've seen Warren grade well and improve and it just seems like the Steelers aren't in love with Harris. And I think his role only grows, his meaning Warren's. Okay. All right. All right. For the, for the sake of time, we'll do Warren at 22. We'll do Robinson Jr. at 23. And we need to find our 24th and final. And that's either, it sounds like it's either Montgomery, Corum, or Wright. I, I think it's got to be Wright. That's the home run potential, right? It's kind of like what you said with with H hand, but, but to a lesser extent, it's the same thing. Wright's a home run hitter. He's a boomer bust type of runner, and he's in a in an offense with a lot of boom in the running game. So, I I think it has to be right. All right, I'm I'm locking it in, man. So we got Warren at 22, Robinson Jr. at 23, and Jalen Wright at 24. I'm going to fill out the, the rest of the 32 just so that we can social media graphic this. But uh, I think that was a pretty good list. And it, it is kind of scary because the state of running back in the NFL, like compared to what we talked about at receiver, right? Where there was like 50 to 70 guys that like we probably like over most of the running backs that we just talked about. It's kind of scary. Yeah, it is. But that's that's just the state of, of running back. It just, you know, it's the nature of the beast. Yeah. Okay, well... For the sake of time, again, I know we both have to run. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook at all22 all twenty two underscore PFF. And then give us a review wherever you watch or listen to your podcast. And have a great day. I'm a ghost.